So, what we did was to start off with uh, very basics of the circuit that uh, hopefully now by now you have used these things enough to remember how to do any of these things. Time domain analysis of uh, passive circuits typically we evaluate the step response based on the initial and final conditions and the poles and lot of times what you are interested in is effectively a first order circuit. So, by inspection you should be able to figure out where the poles and zeros of the circuit are at least the poles are or the time constants are and so on. Uh, similarly, in the frequency domain you evaluate the transfer function using the poles and zeros again in lot of cases especially in the first order type of cases you can uh, you should be able to write this down by inspection ok by evaluating the DC gain and the poles and the zeros. And we also see how to uh, represent uh, uh, how to uh, represent this thing graphically you plot the sinusoidal steady state response the magnitude and phase of that in a Bode plot ok. So, essentially you know how to uh, characterize all these circuits with time varying inputs of two different types one is where it is piecewise constant it goes from one value to another value that is basically the step response the other one where uh, there you uh, end up evaluating both the transient and the steady state response the other one is with sinusoids and typically here also you can calculate the transient response, but we usually do not bother with it and we evaluate the steady state response because that is what is more significant in practice as well ok. You apply a sinusoid and you wait for the transients to die out and you measure the output ok. And I think by now you also understand why sinusoids are universally used as test signals right because they are eigenvectors of uh, linear systems. Uh, sinusoid going through a linear system will be another sinusoid. So, it is very easy to both in the lab to apply and measure as well as for an, uh, to analyze the circuits ok. Then we went through the concepts of uh, negative feedback amplifier and the op amp. So, what we uh, did was to evaluate uh, what what we did was to figure out how to control some quantity precisely and we saw that the way to do it was by taking the error or the difference between the desired and the actual values somehow sense that and integrate the error. And that uh, business of taking the difference and integrating the error gives you a ready made block known as the op amp which is widely used and we have studied that in enough detail. And you also know that when it is a negative feedback the input of the integrator has to be 0 or the inputs of the op amp become 0 which gives you the virtual short. Uh, concept right and that virtual short is uh, what enables you to analyze op amp circuits easily that is if you assume ideal op amps which are in negative feedback which is the most important thing otherwise the two inputs will not be virtually short. Then we discussed the basic op amp uh, circuits and how to bias them from a single supply and dual supply and so on ok. And this also led to the uh, led us to this AC coupling circuits which we use to separate the DC bias and the signal value. Of course, these things work only if uh, the signal itself is not DC right it has to be above a certain frequency then you can always choose a large enough capacitor. So, that it allows that signal, but blocks DC ok. And we also saw the basic op amp model which includes uh, saturation limits to the supplies as well as offset. In fact, that offset tells you uh, immediately why the op amp has to be in DC negative feedback otherwise it would not get biased correctly at all. It has to be biased in the high gain region right otherwise it would not work like an op amp. The reason you have a virtual short at the inputs is because it is operating in a high gain region. So, for any reasonable output the input will be nearly 0 ok. So, this one just to show you the model I think you should have seen uh, data sheets of op amp by now, but you can see that if you look at the op amp data sheet the offset voltage will be listed for instance here it says some 3 milli volts and then a maximum of 5 milli volts and so on. And here the output voltage swing again with a 15 volt supply it says typically you can go up to 13.5 volts. So, that means that there is some gap between the highest swing and the upper supply and the lowest swing and the lower supply, but of course, for the First, for 0th order modeling you assume that the saturation limits are equal to the supply voltages ok. So, if you go through the op amp data sheet you will see many of the things that we discussed not the analysis, but the uh, 
value of the parameters right. and then we found that uh, the negative feedback circuits can have a problem because you have parasitic capacitances, parasitic poles everywhere right. Essentially you have delays everywhere. So, if you have negative feedback with a delay it is very easy to imagine instability right because you are sensing if you imagine the sensing and comparison you are sensing not the current value, but the value that occurred sometime back ok and that can be a, a serious problem it can lead to oscillation and we also analyze it rigorously with uh, models of op amps using 1, 2 and 3 poles and so on and saw that the more the number of poles the more you have problems with instability. So, you can, uh, but you can get around this and essentially the idea is to make it look effectively like a first order system right that is where the loop gain is significant it appears like a first order response. This is not the only way to stabilize negative feedback circuits, but this is one of the ways ok and a very commonly used way also. So, then uh, you push all the non dominant poles and zeros beyond the unity loop gain frequency and you will end up with a nearly stable I mean you will end up with a stable system that uh, behaves nearly like a first order uh, system ok. And we also discussed like how to make op amps with high gains and because we are not discussing transistors they are a bit limited here, but we saw that the gain that you can get from each stage is limited maybe up of the order of few tens or uh, hundreds. So, to get very large gains you have to put multiple stages together, but once you do that you automatically bring in the problem of multiple poles and instability ok. So, one of the very popular architectures of the op amp is to use two stages like this and again there are different ways of uh, stabilizing it by making one or the other capacitor bigger, but we saw that the most efficient the best way it was to connect a capacitor across the second stage ok. So, that gives you uh, a 0 in addition to moving the poles in the way that you want right it gives you pole splitting right it moves one of the poles to a higher frequency and another pole to a lower frequency. So, <coughs> that uh, gives you a stable system and we also discussed stability criteria like uh, the phase margin which is the phase lag at the which is related to the phase lag at the unity loop gain frequency ok. <coughs> between uh, here the input and the output yeah that is possible. See this is a again uh, we have not discussed transistor level circuits the reason I put the buffer there was so that I do not get distracted by the current that is drawn right we used to we use this op amp in other circuits where something is connected to it ok. So, first of all very frequently you use this without the buffer ok that is how it is and if you had an ideal buffer that would be fine and the buffer itself will be not ideal. So, uh, in that case putting it to the output may not be the best idea either ok. So, if you design op amps on ICs right typically you do not have this extra buffer ok there are many reasons for it you do not need it because you know what load you are going to connect and also with uh, low supply voltages it is getting harder and harder to make buffers ok which have a good swing limit because you want the swing limit to be as large as possible right you want it to be equal to the supply you will get slightly less than that. But uh, on the other hand the general purpose op amps that you use in the lab they do have a buffer ok. There also it is not connected uh, to the output because the buffer itself will be non ideal and this is a better choice ok. So, again you can look at the op amps I think I showed you this before but you do not need <coughs> you would not be able to understand the transistor level stuff, but at least you can recognize the first stage here in red the second stage in blue and the buffer in this purple violet color and across the second stage you see the compensation capacitor and you can also see the uh, frequency response I mean this is only the magnitude plot you can see that it has a first order roll off all the way down to 0 dB ok and there are two different curves uh, that is at uh, basically two different supply voltages it turns out that in this particular case the parameters of the control sources the gm value depends on the supply voltage. So, that is why the unity gain frequency which you know is gm 1 by cc 
also depends on the supply voltage ok. And here is another op amp again the first stage is shown in red the second stage in uh, uh, blue and across the second stage you see the compensation cap and you see a buffer ok. So, there also you have the body plot. Uh, so, you have the gain that is rolling down as a first order uh, 20 d minus 20 d per decade gain and then you also have the phase you can see the unity uh, gain frequency the phase is about 50 degrees. So, the phase margin is about 50 degrees ok. <coughs> I mean this is the left side axis refers to the gain magnitude and the right side to the phase. Then we went to DC DC converters of course, they are uh, practically very important, but at a high level they are yet another negative feedback system where the DC to DC conversion uh, AC to AC conversion is easy with the transformer, but with switches you can do something similar for DC. One way to think about it is that uh, you convert DC to AC right as a time varying waveform and pass it through something or here you can think of uh, modulating the average value of DC by changing the duty cycle ok. But doing that gives you a time varying waveform with a which are the desired average the time variation is removed by using a low pass filter ok. So, that is what this L and C does. So, here you get a DC and then you compare it to uh, V ref and uh, stabilize it and so on. Uh, we discussed one particular way of stabilizing it which is the same dominant pole stuff where you make sure that uh, the loop gain has a first order behavior and beyond the unity loop gain frequency. Uh, because of the LC this is a little more complicated the shape of the loop gain after that it peaks and so on, but you just make sure that it always stays below 0 dB and you are fine ok. So, in connection with this we also discuss the average model from the duty cycle to the output this is actually a nonlinear uh, system in that what we control is the duty cycle and from duty cycle to the output it is nonlinear in that if you double the duty cycle it is not as though the output waveform will double the width of the output pulses will double ok. So, but uh, if the sampling period is if the switching period is small then within each period the voltage varies uh, very little and it is ok to use the average model you just assume that you have just the LTI linear time invariant LC filter driven by V s times the duty cycle the average value of V s ok. Then we went to the instrumentation amplifier the motivation was to try and uh, measure the small measure small differences between uh, two voltages which may individually be large and this also led us to the uh, notion of uh, common mode rejection ratio uh, which basically tells you the because we have two independent inputs. Uh, the output will not be just proportional to the difference ok. And the way we uh, analyzed it was to decompose the signal into common mode and differential components ok. This is exactly like decomposing a vector along some two axes right. So, because we have the desired response to be the differential one and the undesired one to be common mode it makes sense to use those axes. And uh, we saw that uh, basically the circuits which uh, with ideal op amps amplify only the difference, but amplify also the common mode ok. So, first of all the op amp itself should have a sufficiently high common mode rejection ratio which is the ratio of gain to the differential signal to the gain to the common mode signal ok. That is one thing and then in this particular amplifier we also saw that if you have uh, mismatches and register, register values you get uh, non zero common mode gain ok. In fact, within the op amp it is mismatch between different components which could influence the common mode gain also ok. Uh, other reasons as well, but that is one of them. So, we uh, discussed that and then again if you go to the op amp data sheet you can see. So, for a particular op amp here the common mode rejection ratio is given and in our case common mode rejection ratio was just a number, but I had think I had mentioned just like the differential gain which changes with frequency right. We intentionally make it change with frequency this also changes with frequency you can see that it is probably about 85 dB here at low frequencies and after that it rolls off ok. <coughs> then we discuss filters we started with passive RLC filters which uh, you are all familiar with and we made the state variable filter which is essentially emulating the equations of the RLC filter 
using integrators ok using uh, op amp integrators or gmc integrators and then there are also other uh, sort of ad hoc topologies which people came up with. So, that with a single op amp you get second or third order filters and so on. So, that is basically all this stuff. Uh, bottom line is you should be able to uh, analyze any filter topology using ideal op amps and also you know that any high order filter that you want can be realized using first and second order sections. So, any filter that is given to you at least at the ideal op amp level you should be able to come up with the schematic. We also discussed how to order it so that it can handle the largest swing etc. Et okay. Then we went on to oscillators. So basically, there are three different types of oscillators. One is the L, one uh, is those that use uh, LC resonance. Of course, any real LC resonance circuit will have loss and you can compensate it and we discussed that and that particular oscillator actually is used widely in practice. So, uh, that is useful as well at high frequencies it is used and then you have any filter that you carelessly design will oscillate essentially that is what the next thing is. So, you make q equal to infinity and it will oscillate. So, the double integrator oscillator or uh, Wien bridge oscillator and so on ok. And finally, we have uh, other uh, types of oscillators which are heavily nonlinear or at least some internal components are heavily nonlinear like the Schmidt trigger right. So, you know the Schmidt trigger oscillator these are relaxation oscillators which are also useful, but at very low frequencies. And finally, we discussed uh, the rudiments of data converters that is uh, the business of taking a continuous time continuous valued signal to a discrete time discrete valued signal and back to continuous time ok. You go from uh, continuous time continuous valued signal to a digital signal using an analog to digital converter and the other way using a digital to analog converter ok. So, first of all for sampling you need a track and hold circuit. And if you really need a sampled and held waveform that is something that is held for the entire sampling period you put two of them together to make a sample and hold. But a lot of applications track and hold is good enough and you have uh, this uh, uh, analog to digital conversion which essentially involves comparing the sampled value to a number of thresholds. How you do it is up to you you can simultaneously compare with every possible one this is obviously what you would do if you want the fastest conversion or you can do it in sequence and there is an intelligent way of uh, doing it in sequence which is the binary search that gives you a number of architectures and one of them the SAR ADC is what we discussed and that is what is shown in the block diagram here also right. So, this is from this maxim which makes these converters. Uh, so, you have a track and hold and a comparator in the feedback path you have the successive approximation register and the DAC. So, it changes the threshold and finally, this converges to a value close enough to be in and the digital output is taken out. So, we need a D to A converter to make this ADC, but as well as I mean not only for this you also need it for other purposes to in fact convert digitally stored signals into analog signals. And uh, some of the ways of making it are by using resistor based racks or capacitor based racks. So, you have a number of elements somehow you arrange them so that you can pick one of the 2 to the n possible voltages and provide them to the output ok. So, there are like too many to list here, but uh, there are register string tracks and R 2 R DACs and binary weighted DACs and so on. And it turns out that the binary weighted capacitor DAC is the most suited for SAR ADCs ok. And finally, I think you probably interacted with the whole army of TS. So, it is such a large class that it is only thanks to them that we are able to even run the course ok.